and we're going. And we are also recording, is that right? We are recording. Great. So yeah, welcome, welcome to Research Software Hour episode two. Uh, welcome back for those who were here last week, and uh, and welcome those who are watching first time. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, we should maybe say since there are a few new watchers, so uh, who we are and what this is about, and then what we will talk about today. Yeah, so. I'm Richard Darst, and my colleague here is Vada van Vast. I work at Alta University in Helsinki, and I work in what's basically our high-performance computing group, where we support researchers in all types of scientific computing. My name is Hadovan. I'm calling from Tromsø. I work at the University of Tromsø, also in the high-performance computing, supporting resource groups in making better use of the resources, teaching programming tools, languages, programming myself, or uh, resource software engineering. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, with Richard, uh, we collaborate on the Code Refinery project where we teach workshops and where we talk about the topics like today. Yeah. Yeah. So after working on Code Refinery for several years together, we eventually decided that that wasn't enough and we needed another way to reach even more people at once. And thus, well, we're here now. And we thought this would be also fun to try out recording and twitching uh, the new media. Yeah. And this series is about, so it's about programming, it's about research software, it's about scripting. We will have Linux stuff, uh, beta, or maybe some high performance computing. We yeah. try to show something that is easy, maybe something that is more difficult. We try to teach each other something new. We try to learn from the audience. Yeah, I learned something for today's lesson also. And yeah, so we will, in these sessions, we try to have something for everyone. So our goal is to start off a bit basic, but make sure that by the end, everyone has something which is new to them, hopefully to us too. And we really value your comments and questions. So most of what we're talking about today has come from questions that you all had last week. So please keep them coming. And we, so in, indeed, we would also like to acknowledge uh, last time we got help from our viewers, help moving questions from the chat to the to the collab collaborative HackMD. So thanks a lot for that, for organizing questions, answering questions. Because it's it's quite overwhelming to to speak and plan and watch different screens. So I have here a three screen, three computer setup. <laughs> so thanks a lot for that. And also we would like to thank for uh, topic suggestions. And indeed, the two main topics that we will talk about today uh, are based on suggestions from from viewers from last time. And I think this is the ideal case where we get where we build this around questions and about suggestions from from viewers. Yeah, if you can just treat us as your colleague next to you that you can ask any question for, that's basically the right thing here. Yes. And, uh, this time we will uh, focus on two topics. We will talk about more and more than that, but uh, the two main topics today we will discuss pull requests, code review. So we'll look at pull requests in GitHub and in GitLab. And we will try to look at we will look at dependency management how how can we record dependencies of our, our of our codes to make them reusable reproducible mm -hmm. we will try to do <clears throat> some some basic stuff uh, at the beginning but then more advanced uh, towards the end yeah yeah so one of the first things we can talk about is a question from last time so someone asked is our Zenodo datasets indexed in Google Scholar? And we looked a little bit, and it turns out that no, it's not. And it seems like it's partly for technical reasons and partly, um, well, they claim mainly for technical reasons. Who knows if it's partly because of publishers trying to keep their stuff exclusive. But 
it was things like it's mixed content. So basically it was hard to make it where it could be crawled by Google and indexed in a uniform way. Since there can be images, data, all kinds of stuff there. And then also it claimed something about the URL scheme or something like that, which I didn't really understand. Um, there is a link which I'm pasting into the HackMD um, about this. Um, Again, we really appreciate questions. So you find this uh, collaborative notes where you can ask questions and answer questions below on Twitch below the uh, below the screens. Yeah. So and also, uh, I want, didn't want to forget to say that we will show some examples today. So we will do some hands-on coding, but. It's not the full story, of course. We have the time is limited, so the the full story usually goes deeper, and we will try not to go too deep into the rabbit hole. But some of the things that will come up, we can pick up in later discussions and in later sessions. Yeah. So in the post stream chat time, basically ask us all the really hard questions you have, and we'll see what we can do. So should we get started then? Let's do it. Yeah. So the first. The topic that we will look at is something that is very close to my heart. It's, I think it's very important. It's something for everybody, and that is uh, pull requests. And uh, pull requests, uh, the name is historical. It's maybe not very intuitive. On GitLab, so on GitHub, these are called pull requests. On GitLab, they are called merge requests. This will be about code review. The way I like to call them and imagine them is I like to think of change proposals. So we will talk about how to make change proposals on GitHub and on GitLab. And these are, so these enab enable us to propose a change and the change to be reviewed. And yeah. uh, this is when, when you don't have write permissions to the repository, this is the only way. But we will motivate that this is also a really nice way to have changes reviewed within the team if you work within your research team and you have write permissions to the, to the repository. So yeah. we, will, we will show it and we will try to explain what it is. Yeah, so last time one of our watchers asked this question about how, well, actually he was there and realized that, oh, I didn't think I needed to know pull requests, but actually I do. So we he sent us a mail and we started talking and now we have our guest here. So we have Chris who is here. Um, Chris is a professor in the math and CS departments here at Alto University, and he's a cryptographer. So, welcome, Chris. Welcome, Chris. So cool that you that you joined today, and really cool that you said, that you approached us with this uh, with this question, and we will together try hands-on or submit pull requests and discuss them. But before we go there, maybe maybe we can I can ask you a question or two. And one would be, um, so what do you usually use uh, GitHub for? So we can't hear you yet. Are you still muted? Or is it on? Can you hear me now? Yes, oh, you are. very well. OK, great. Welcome, welcome again, Chris. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, OK, so um, I don't use Git for uh, collaborative uh, code writing. I usually use Git for writing papers with uh, other researchers. So uh, first, we have, have our discussions and do the research. And then when we turn to the writing, um, we do the writing and editing together. Um, and it's usually between two and five people working on the same paper, writing the same paper uh, together. Um, and yeah, Git has become um, the popular tool to do this in recent years. Before it was SVN, and now it's now it's become Git. And this is, I think, a nice example also to show that Git and GitHub and GitLab they are not only for code. Code. It can be scripts. It can be websites. It can be manuscripts. It can be proposals, even books. Mm -hmm. We can write books on, on GitHub. So I think this is yeah. a really nice example of how, how this can be used. And yeah. when you when you said that you collaborate on, on manuscripts and papers, so when you so how do you review <clears throat> uh, each other's changes? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so oh, like, um, oh, maybe we should use pull requests. We, we don't. So currently, our workflow is uh, pretty informal. So we don't review each change that someone else makes, but um, we read the sections that we write many times and see um, whether we agree with this current state. And if not, we iterate it. And um, um, if we think, oh, someone else might disagree, we ping each other. But it's a very um, very informal process um, where in the end, we typically in the end agree with the whole version of the paper. Um, Do you typically work on a, a public uh, repository or on a private that you that you make public then upon publication or how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, we usually work on a private repository. Um, so, um, okay. hmm. So what we can try, uh, we, what we will try together now is uh, we will have a look at one of one of the projects that uh, Chris would like to contribute to, or con it contributes to, and we will we will we will see how we can make a contribution through a change proposal through a pull request. Um, maybe I can sh start sharing screen. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. For your and also, uh, before I go there, uh, we want to encourage listeners to ask questions as we go along, because what we will do after, after like a ten-minute demo, uh, we will uh, we will make a, a question and answer session where we comment on these and answer these. So the more questions, the better. The more we go off script here, the better. I'm sharing screen. I'm looking at uh, the projects, and we will go into the MLS protocol. So that's the one. Yeah. Do you want to tell us what MLS is? Ah, yeah. So, okay. So I'm a cryptographer. I work on secure communication between A and B. And so MLS stands for message layer security. And this is essentially the new messaging standard that we're developing that will be used or hopefully be adopted by most of the message messaging apps. Mm -hmm. So you're really um, doing and... real stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> stuff that we're all going to use someday. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I also analyzed the TLS, which is what we currently use to uh, to do the to encrypt the Twitch cool. screen. So oh, wow. That's so... I, I try. <laughs> I try to, to, to apply kind of. Uh, uh... <laughs> that is really I'm not sharing screen. What I will do first is I will uh, browse a little bit around and comment, and then we will go into the file and we will try to submit a change together. So this is the GitHub repository. There is, there are actually many many branches, twenty three, but we are now on the master branch. There are a couple of files here. There is a readme file. Uh, there is automated testing. So if I now scroll in, there are files that control automated automated building. This is something that we should revisit at a later episode. So every time somebody or uh, every time a change is merged, an automated build happens. And I think in this case, as far as I understand it, in this case it builds the documentation. And it's build it builds the documentation based on our markdown files. And in this project, uh, we there are a couple of pull requests already open. So five of them are already open. So these are these change proposals that we will submit. And they are numbered 331. So there have been already many change proposals merged. And we will try to send one or two today. I will go back into the overview. And I think our goal is to make a change to the draft IETF MLS protocol of MD. I will click on the markdown file and let's have a look. It is a it is a very long file. Introduction, change log. There are some sections, terminology. So the uh, this cryptography protocol is described in this file. What we see here is the rendered version of the Markdown file. If we want to see the sources, I could inspect the sources by clicking on row. So on the row, let me zoom in. We can see the actual source code, which is also readable. And uh, 
these hashes here, they mean this is a title. And then if you have two of them, it's a, sub, it's a subtitle, subsection. So this is Markdown. This is Markdown syntax, and it gets rendered to what we have seen here, and which gets further then built into, into a web page documentation. And I have browsed this a bit before, before our session here, and there are two changes that we could do together. One of, one of the two, or maybe we have time for both. One was that at the end of this document, there is a Python code. There are some Python code snippets, but they are not highlighted. So the syntax is not highlighted. What we could try to do is to add syntax highlighting. This would be a one-line change, two-line change. We could try that. The other thing that we can try is it's a very, very long file with lots of lots of uh, sections. And what has to one has to know that they are there. What would be helpful for me as somebody who doesn't know the project at all would be to have a table of contents. So what we can try to do is we, I don't know the project at all, but together we would try to add a table of contents on top of this file in like five minutes. Should we try to do that? Any, anything I forgot or any questions from Richard or Chris? So no. Let's do it. Good. Yeah. So I will show uh, I will show how to make a change proposal directly here through the web. Maybe if we have time left, maybe I will also show you how we can do that through uh, through creating the commit locally. Maybe later. But let's try to make a relatively simple change here directly through the web. And we can do that by clicking, the first step is to click on this edit button, so to edit the file. And I will later realize that I cannot edit the file directly because I'm not part of this MLS team, but I, I can send a change proposal because this project is public. And for to get a table of content for Markdown files, I can show you one trick that I started using recently, because in Markdown, to my knowledge, one cannot get a table of contents automatically in contrast to restructured text. And I think at, uh, also at some later episode, we should contrast these two. We should have a look at markdown and restructured text more closely and compare the two and discuss when we prefer the one, when we prefer the other. But here I will show you a trick. And the trick is, I don't remember the page, but I will search for it. And I search for GitHub markdown TOC, table of contents. And I land at this page here. And this is a really nice tool that I will fetch the tool from the web. And we will post a link to it on, on our HackMD notes. But I will fetch this tool with wget. I download the tool. I make it executable. And it's called ghmd doc. doc. And now I can run it directly on, I can run it directly on the Markdown file. So I will copy the, the URL of the Markdown file and run it directly on it. And it generates me this table of contents and I don't have to type it myself. And now my goal is to oof, copy all the thing. Uh, copy, copy, and now back to the, back to editing the file. So I'm I'm back on GitHub edit button, and whatever we do here will be only a suggestion. The suggestion can be then discussed and it can be modified and improved. I think I will introduce it just before the introduction in here. Let's see whether that works, paste. So I have pasted this table of contents, which I have generated with the tool. And now before, down here, I can commit the change so I, I can record it. But before I do that, what I like to do is I preview my changes. So on top here, I click on preview to verify what am I really about to record here. And Visually, I see that I have added this section here, table of contents. And if I would scroll across the whole file, I would see that I have not modified anything else. 
and now I can save it. And I do not have write permissions to this repository. So the only option that I have is to propose a file change. And I give it a descriptive commit message, adding a table of contents. And if I want it, I could give a more, more background here. I will now propose the file change. Am I ready to propose the file change or did I forget something? No, I think we are ready. I click on the green button here, propose file change. And now we are presented with this form. I can, where I can create this change proposal, the pull request. And here I can verify that uh, from which branch to which branch this proposal goes, from which repository to which repository. You can observe now that maybe the font is tiny, but what GitHub did for me here is it created a fork. It created a copy of the whole project into my user space. And from this user, from this copy, I can now submit this change proposal. And normally I would look at what, what am I submitting? This is my commit and these are the changes. So let's create it. And in here, uh, and, and I think here I ask Chris to help me out whether the title is descriptive enough. Maybe yeah. I should add uh, some context. So if I, if I knew and remembered Chris's username, I could now ping, I could mention Chris in this, in this uh, pull request. Yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. the username is uh, uh, Chris Brzezowska. Hopefully like this. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, live on Twitch. And now, uh, uh, when, uh, before I create the pull request, I in fact have two choices. They are interesting to mention. In this case, we are happy with the change and I can submit the change proposal and then the maintainers can review it. But if I'm not ready yet, I can submit a draft pull request. And that can be useful to signal that I have half finished work and it's not meant to be merged, but I want to collect feedback. So this can be a nice way to show half finished work and collect feedback to make it better. But here we are really happy. Let's create it. And now uh, the maintainers are notified and they can review the changes. Just Comment that, on them. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Just that that um, um, the pull request can be um, modified. Who can modify it? And how does it work? I think that's a, that's a really ex excellent question because now here we have a conversation thread. And here we have a possibility to comment on these changes, suggest changes. And now the, so the excellent question is, how would I apply changes? Who can do them? So I can apply changes by pushing commits to the same branch. This branch got automatically named uh, patch one. Here we go. So if I commit new changes to the same branch, they get added to the, to the pull request. If you can also, I think this is maybe the default that you can allow the maintainers to also uh, suggest changes and apply changes. But typically it would go that uh, other people uh, suggest changes and you would, uh, you, you as the contributor would apply them until we are all happy with the change. Here we also see there is some automated build, uh, build happening that is uh, now failing. And now we would have to have a look whether this is something that I broke or whether this is something that was already problematic before. But as soon as we are all happy, uh, the, the changes would get merged into the master branch in this case. Any, any other questions? Chris or Richard or audience, but we will come back to, I think, to the HackMD questions in a moment. Yeah, I don't see any particular HackMD questions. There's a good link there about how to write good commit messages. 
So mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about how this can promote collaboration? Like, why would a team use this if they don't need to? So that's a question to me, right? Yeah, to whoever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, the, what I like about this mechanism is that it's not only to make sure that the code or the change is correct and good, but also collaborative learning. Um, if at least at least two people know know about the change, so within within a research group, it can really help to transfer knowledge. It can be reviewer learning from the from the submitter, submitter learning from the reviewer. And there is also these pull requests and these discussions, they stay, they are part of the project. So we have also a trace of changes, why they happened, what was the reasoning, uh, how did we agree on things. If we have time, I could also show maybe one or two other pull requests where we can see these uh, discussions and not sure whether we should do that. Do we have time? Maybe we can come back to it later if there is time. That sounds good. Yeah. So what I was going to add to this discussion. So I worked in, I've worked in several teams where we basically didn't collaborate as much as we should. It's basically everyone's doing their own things. So I thought that basically bringing pull requests into our workflow will help us to be more collaborative because it basically provides something that you actually can discuss and you can see what's going on, which is an opportunity that doesn't exist when you're just basically, you know, pushing to your own code and there's no need for anyone else to see it. Mm -hmm. So that sort of worked, but as we talked about last time, if people don't have time to review the stuff, then well, does anything come out of it? Well, very slowly. Yeah. Maybe I can also ask you what are the things that, and this is maybe also a question to the audience. So what are the things that you normally look at when you review a pull request? I think it depends, yeah. but. There is a really so, good, go ahead, Chris. Ah, no, I mean, in, in this case, this is this is not, not code, but, uh, mm-hmm. um, um, I try to understand what the uh, what the change is that is proposed, mm-hmm. and then we have a for this particular project we have a working working group meeting where the different pull requests are then discussed jointly, and then uh, we try to understand um, what's being proposed, and um, the proposers uh, present the proposal, and then we make a decision on the pull request. Yeah. How does we know? So you re- review it together in a group, like on a big screen or something? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Nice. I think that's a really great practice. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, what... this is international collaboration, so um, we're not physically all in the same room. We are scattered around the world, and we have a collaborative call um, where we review the changes. Yeah. Is this how all of the IETF standards are developed now? Um, I think that for TLS, the meetings used to be physical meetings. Oh, for for MLS, actually, uh, uh, actually, also this has now changed. This is a, um, a Corona mm. uh, induced change, I think. Uh, but it, it seems actually a very good workflow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one interesting thing I heard recently, I'm not sure if it was from one of you or from someone else, is that when you're making a pull request, you can also say what you think needs to be reviewed. Like, are you pretty sure this is just some typo fixes and it's fine? Or is it the kind of thing that you want someone to think, is this even a good idea? Please tell me if it's not, and so on. So I think that's always a good idea yeah, I'm going to try to do now. You know, instead of submitting 2,000 line change to, to, well, to say, these are things that, I mean, you can look at, but probably fine, but I'm really unsure about this point and this point and this point. Mm-hmm. And you really help the reviewer. It takes time to review. Yeah. It's, it is work. 
And, and also, I, I should not forget to say that well, we demonstrated GitHub and its pull request, but the same mechanism, same principle on GitLab that is called merge request, but really the same yeah. two names for the same thing. Yeah. And same from the command line, too, basically. It's just a different way of making the changes. Yes. And um, in this case, it was a really relatively small change. So I went through the web editor. But if this was longer work, I would probably make the fork first, clone the fork, and work on my computer, and then yeah. uh, then publish my changes uh, to my fork and submit the pull request from there. But it can be a nice, a nice way for smaller changes type yeah. There is a suggestion in the chat to maybe show how to alert someone to the pull request or issue, which I think you actually did in this one. You used at and Chris's username. so he was alerted to it. And... Yeah, so I can, mention, I can mention the usernames that I know. And also the maintainers, what they can do is that they can assign reviewers. Uh, and they can, so a pull request can be assigned to certain person or persons. So I've dispatched if, if they know that this is specialty of this and this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're at a little bit over half time, and I guess we should continue on. Any last questions from the audience? Well, write it in the hackpad and we'll get back to it later. Any last things from you, Chris, or Radon? No, thanks for going through this. This is uh, very nice. Thanks for adding a table of content to our project. I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very useful. I will also send the Python highlighting later after the show. But uh, Chris, thanks so much for for joining and for uh, for uh, suggesting this uh, this segment here. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Okay. So next up, I will talk about a little something. I will talk about code linters, um, and code linting. So, oops, uh, I need to, there we go. Okay, I'm getting my desktop all set up and I need to share it so that Radovan can see it in real time. Um, okay, you should be able to see my desktop in the Jitsi now. And I do, thanks. Okay, great. So here we are. So yeah, what you could ask is code linting. So I made a little demo here. Um, this repository, which I can send a link later, there's a file called messy.py here. And if we look at this, we see it's a messy file. There's some stuff like an extra space here, no documentation string in the function, and this function is being called the wrong way. So linters basically run on the code and point out what some common errors could be. So it's really the kind of thing that's usually integrated in editors these days, so that as you're writing, you see it directly. And in fact, in my Emacs here, that's what happens. So I start the, uh, I start my editor, and it will point out some of the problems. But for this case, we're going to do it a different way. We're going to do it from the command line. If we run pylint um, on, let me make sure this is the right pylint. Yes, pylint on messy. We see module messy. There's an extra space, and it even points out exactly where. Um, it's missing a doc string. An argument is not used, and some uh, well, there's some error in the function. So I'm going to go. The, the yeah. also uh, auto format. So pylint does not auto format. There's other things that can do that, and mm -hmm. I'm basically not. That's sort of a matter for another time. This is supposed to be a five-minute section, so this can only just briefly introduce you to the 
um, so the concept and it can become a 15 minute section later. So I'm going to edit this um, and let's give it an argument and let it pass. Okay, it's getting better. Um, so what happens if there's some things here that you know you um, that you know you want to accept? Like this unused argument, what if I know that I'm going to use it later? So it's OK. Uh, so I can come here into the function and do and say pilot disable unused argument, just like this. And actually here you can start seeing the integration of the linter in my editor. Um, so mm -hmm. here I cover over and it says, actually, that's not quite. OK, well, it's not quite working. Um, OK, well, I'm not sure what's wrong, but that's OK, because that's not the main point of this right now. So if I run the linter, then now we should see, hmm, it still says unused argument. What can be wrong? Um, pilot, disable, unused argument. This really should be the right thing. I wonder why it's not working. Um, Hmm. You know, I even um, tested this today, and of course, it's not working. Hmm. I'm going to try copying directly from the other thing I did. Uh, maybe, anyway. Ah, uh, uh, OK, yes. Um, someone in the chat did it. Yeah, of course. You know, every time I use pilot, I always get something wrong here. The colon's a new one. Usually I forget it's disabled and I do ignore or something like that. Anyway, so here and now it's ignored. So when you're using these linters, what do you think? Should they be mostly, should everything be clean or should some things be left or whatever? Uh, right on, what's your opinions here? So I'm using the... Uh, I'm using this black tool, and I'm not sure that's a linter, maybe. And we also get a question about that on yeah. the hackandy. Use that to auto format. I admit that I don't use PyLint yet. Maybe I should. Yeah. I think also in this case, uh, it was good that it warned us about this unused argument, and maybe we should have made sure mm -hmm. to, to then actually use it. So I think these are useful tools. They can be built in into the Git workflow. So you can even run, make it run automatically every time you yeah. save or every time you commit. In fact, that's a great thing to bring up. That's what I'm about to demonstrate next using something called pre-commit. So I'm making sure my virtual environment is activated. So in Python, there's something called pre-commit which to be honest, I didn't really like at first. It, there was a little bit too much magic there. So installing stuff without me really knowing about it and, um, and all that. Um, so I'm, uh, so I'm copying in this pre-commit config file. So basically what pre-commit does is it sort of automates setting up things to run as a commit hook in Git. So all of this you could do without pre-commit. You could make a script that would run pylint on everything and then, and then, well, exit just the same. So that's sort of why I didn't like pre-commit, too much magic. But anyway, so after I've copied this in here, we see it defines a repo that has pylint. And this repository defines how the pre-commit uh, pre hook would work. And then there's the, some tag in Git, and then the hook that's going to be run. And then you run pre-commit install, and it 
does some magic and puts some hook here. Let's open it up quickly. Um, so we see a bunch of stuff, which I read earlier in the day, but it's not the point to go into it more later. The point is someone has sort of figured it out to work, so you don't have to. So now let's try to commit here. I'm going to edit messy and I guess add an extra line at the bottom. And then I'm going to try to git commit. And now we see it's initializing environment. So it's going and downloading stuff from this repository and is installing pylint into a private, um, private little repository. And it runs and now it tells us what the errors are before I can mm -hmm. commit. So basically it won't let me commit until it's clean. Mm -hmm. So if I go back and start fixing up these other things, And now I have to add a bit more, which I'm doing with dash P. And okay, there's trailing new lines at the end. I have to add, let's see what happens if I don't add. So it says it's not staged. Yep, I have to add dash P again. And what do you know? There it's done. So, mm -hmm. okay, and that's that. So this is something that we can talk more about later because this can only be the briefest introduction to it. So I only started looking at pre-commit today and after learning how it works to make myself a bit more comfortable, I'm sort of happy with it. Like I could see myself using this a bit more often. Mm -hmm. Have you used this oh. before, Radovan? Uh, pre commits? Yeah. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I've because I I somehow prefer to to test things than uh, kind of post commit mm -hmm. once they are on GitHub GitLab. So I let mm -hmm. I let the machines test it, but of course then there is a follow up that I need to do. But the advantage of testing it centrally is that then everybody has the the same experience and the same uh, definitions. I'm also yeah. wondering now, looking at the time, we have 15 minutes left in the show, whether yeah. we should not move into questions and answers and then- Yeah, I guess we, we can have things to show. take the question at the end of the session. So should we postpone questions to the end? Okay. Yeah, and I have some thoughts on black and this automatic code formatting, but yeah. we'll see how much you all agree with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next up on our agenda is managing dependencies in code. So here I've got another um, repository. Actually, it's the same repository. Um, and it has a file called dependencies.py. And let me try to run it. And what do you know? There's something that's not there. So why would managing dependencies be important? So let's say as a, as someone has said before, when you, your biggest collaborator is yourself in the future and yourself in the past. So it's very easy to take some code and need to run it and you wonder, what do I need to install to actually make this work? And then you install what you think you need and either something's missing or something is a different version and it doesn't work anymore and so on. So. Basically, every language these days has some ways to sort of rigorous, rigorously manage these dependencies. And in Python, it's called requirements.txt. So you would start with something like this and then add in, well, the first thing it needs is called mock. And I know that the PyPI package name is called mock. So I'm putting it in here like this. So one thing that can sort of trip you up sometimes is that the PyPI package name doesn't have to be named the same thing as what is imported. But these days, usually most of the things do have the same name. So how do we install these? So I can install it with 
pip install dash r requirement.txt. But this will install it on my whole operating system for every program that's using things. And I really don't want to do that because then everything else I have running will get messed up. And I am really strict about keeping my operating system as clean as possible and separating the stuff I install into some separate other places as much as I can. So Python being a modern language has a way to isolate these dependencies also. And it's called virtual env or virtual environment. And virtual envi environment is basically one Python, uh, one directory where all of the Python packages are installed and you can activate it or deactivate it. And when it's activated, everything goes there and it doesn't see what else is on your system. So it's really great for being able to install stuff. And first off, know that you won't mess anything else on your computer up. And second off, you won't accidentally mess anything else up. And you can, if you ever mess it up itself, you can just delete it and start over again. So to make a virtual environment, I'm using this. And it's just a quick comment there that you can have several of them for each project. So they can be per project because projects may have different dependencies, conflicting dependencies. So I often have one per each project. Yeah. And then when I don't like it anymore, I remove it. It's not, no, nothing happened. Yeah, absolutely. So I have one per project and keep it clean. So I'm installing this using Python 3-M VN. So this means that Python 3 is starting and it's running the VN module that's installed along with Python. This could also be done by doing, actually first I'm going to run this and then I'll do the next thing. Uh, uh huh. Yes, here. You can run virtual end and then give it the directory you want to install to, but then this might install using Python 2 or some other Python. So using this one ensures that you're installing a virtual end with the Python that you select there. So here we go. So now we've got to activate the virtual environment. So to do that, we source.vn bin activate. So this has to be sourced and not executed because it modifies the shell directly using environment variables. So we do this and now we see my shell is saying .vm, meaning that this is activated. And I always like to test to make sure that the right thing is activated. So if I do which Python, I see it is indeed running a Python from inside of the VM. Right. And if you now install anything from here on, pip install, it will go into this environment and not into the system wide Python. Yeah. So now I see pip is also installed here and using the one from the VM. So I always like to test this, even though it should work. If I do it wrong, it'll start installing stuff in the whole operating system. And then, well, that makes my life sad for a little bit as I try to figure out what happened. So, so now that I know we're using the right pip, I do pip install dash r means read from requirements file. So I do this and it installs it. Let's try to run our file again. Oh, there's something else that's needed. So let's go and improve our requirements file. And this is what usually ends up happening to me whenever I make a new requirements file for a project um, I that I forgot to do it. I start it and just sort of trial and error. So what was it, NumPy? And I know the other thing I need is a package called NetworkX. So I save this and let's reinstall the stuff. So here I can tell it install everything, update to these requirements. If it's already installed, it will do it again. And then uh, let's try to run it. And then you typically start out without pinning the versions and then later you pin the versions once you publish the project. Is this how you work? Or maybe this is at least how I work. This is something I'll mention a little bit later, actually. So first let's fix this problem here. Um, yeah, so we see there's some error that says we need a network X that's less than some particular version. So what do you know? We can 
do that in the requirements file, file also. So I say network x less than 2.0. Save and exit, reinstall, and it says on installing new network x, installing old network x, and let's run it. And it says success. So yeah, there we've done it. We've just made the requirements file. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah. So what was next? So exactly what Radovan was saying. So there's this thing. So in this file, we don't say what the versions are that it needs. So is this a good or a bad thing? Or does it depend? Yeah, I think they had a, so this, this is good for coding, but the one problem can be that uh, if I come back to this project in two years, maybe these packages have evolved and it will try to fetch the latest and greatest versions of them mm -hmm. and it might not match anymore my own code yeah. which means that for publishing it it's it's a good idea to pin the the precise versions that you have used so that so that i can rerun it in five years or ten years yeah and i'm just now looking at the time oh, we yeah. don't have much left i don't want to stress you but maybe we have enough time to comment yeah. a bit on similar uh, yeah. tools. Well, there was, so this is, there was one point why? about the pip freezing I wanted to make. So if mm -hmm. you do pip freeze, you see it outputs basically what can go into the requirements.txt to pin all the exact versions. So this is something that actually was really important to me a few months ago. Someone asked that some library published on PyPI to be installed on our cluster. So I go and I do it, and suddenly I see NumPy downgraded, Sphinx downgraded, a bunch of stuff is being downgraded. So someone had made a library and put it on PyPI and had published it with exact versions of things. Well, that works if you're making an environment. So basically, you want this to be run alone with um, with just itself as the main star of the show. But if you want this to be installed with other stuff, then once you pin these versions together, what happens if Network X does the same thing and pins versions to something and then doesn't update it as often as you've done, you do? Suddenly you get a bunch of stuff that can't be co-installed together. So if you're making something that's sort of the end user program, like your analysis scripts and so on, then the exact versions are good because that means you can always run it in the same environment. But if you're making something that serves as a reusable library that you'll use in multiple different projects, then you should have these be as flexible as possible. And then in your actual environment, when you're running the particular analysis, that's where you can pin stuff. And that's where it would pin an older version of this thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm so passionate about this because it took a long time to untangle some software that I was trying to install that has had issues like this. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really good to remember that. Uh, and we have a, we got a couple of questions about that. I think we should come to those yeah. pretty soon. Let's look at those. Let's also mention now. that. Uh, so this is pip and uh, requirements.txt. So this is Python. Mm -hmm. There is also Conda. Conda and environment.yaml, similar ideas, similar motivation. Whereas, so Conda is a bit more general. So you can you can package uh, something that is not Python. There is rnf for R. Anything yeah. else that, oh, if we have time, we should talk a bit about dependencies of compiled languages. How should we track those? Mm -hmm. C++, Fortran, C. But maybe we should go to the questions. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So one question, how does requirements of text relate to setup tools, setup the py? So requirements of text versus setup the py. Another question is requirements of text versus pipenv or poetry. Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer? Or? Yeah, so mm -hmm. I recently had to figure this out to release some stuff. So setup.py has its own way of defining what's required to be installed, which is different from requirements.txt, but some projects 
have set up that py read requirements.txt and then basically in, use that directly so that it doesn't have to be defined twice, which is also what I do for most projects. But then also you search online and some people say requirements.txt should have exact versions for your environment and setup.py should have the general requirements for the library itself, sort of going back to what I'm doing. So really it's sort of up to you what you do. So if you have code which use the setup.py to define a library which is published to PyPI, then I'd say these requirements should be as loose as possible. If you also use this as a local environment to run your research, then requirement.txt can have exact versions in it. And if you don't use it as a local environment and it's only a library, then I link require link setup.py to read from requirements.txt. So that's my personal opinion and what I do there. And it can make a difference whether you whether these are dependencies for the developers or whether these are the dependencies for the end users. Mm -hmm. and then oh, there is pipenv and poetry. So these are alternatives to virtual env. So whereas virtual env is relatively simple and we, we have to do several steps, with pipenv poetry, you can do that in one step. So these alternatives, there is also, it seems to be that the latest, because they have realized that there are a couple of solutions to this and the unif unification seems to be pyproject.toml, which I haven't started mm -hmm. using, but this seems to be the the, the new thing. latest way uh, to, to specify yeah. minimum dependencies. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I'm, rel I'm relatively conservative in what I do, and I tend to stick with what's known and, most importantly, what's simple and doesn't have, have much magic behind it. But, well, yes, uh, there's... Yeah. I often start with requirements of text for something that is living on my computer, and as soon as, eventually, when, when I put it on, on the Python package index, then I set up the setup.py and the rest. Mm -hmm. That's how I do it. Not sure this is the best way. Yeah. We got an earlier. To... Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to mention. Um, we might not have the time, but repro hacks. Mm. So repro hacks, and I po I posted the link on the HackMD. These are really fun events, where you come together with people and you try to reproduce a published computational result of somebody else or of of your friends. And this can be a really nice exercise to, because you will experience problems that may be hard to imagine for your own project in five or ten years. And it's really fun to do, and you will see why these things are important. Uh, Setup.py requirements.txt environment.yaml, why it is important to record the dependencies to make sure that the code uh, remains reproducible in a couple of years. So I would recommend every uh, New, if a new PhD student enters the, the group to first thing to do, give the person one week and uh, try to reproduce our existing published paper. Mm. It's it's fun and it's more difficult than, than we would like it to be. Yeah, that sounds super useful, but also something that most students will end up, well, I guess they'll hate you for it at the start, but then <laughs> by the end of their PhD, they'll be really happy that you did. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, Any other questions we missed? Yeah. We have, of course, more to show. Yeah, there I'm was, sure we have the time. Yeah. There was one question about black and code auto formatting. Um, do you want to answer that first, or should I give my opinion? So, I don't have an educated opinion there. I'm, I'm using black. I have used this yet another Python formatter. Both are fine. Uh, black for me was it's one command and it it does it so I run it. Mm -hmm. How about you? Yeah, so I don't use any of these, and I really don't. So I can see some benefit to them, but also to me it seems like you lose so much. So whenever I code, there's all these things which go beyond the standards and can sort of encode hints, like contextual hints to you. Like my favorite one is when I'm coding, I like to make stuff vertically aligned. 
So if I'm doing something where several lines do the same thing, I'll uh, try to put them on one line and put enough extra spaces in there so that I can scan down and see exactly what the differences are. Or maybe okay. another common one is when doing expressions, then I'll put extra spaces to separate out what's evaluated first and how my mind should parse it instead of how a computer should parse it. And once you run this through something like black, then all of that gets lost. So I really haven't liked the idea of using these for any of my projects before. Um, I can see a point where it forces everyone to be on the same page and actually use something. So for example, the people that would, well, do something differently, then at least you don't have to argue about that kind of thing. Uh, maybe someone's writing in the hack pad about a long, a long, a big project with many people. Yeah, yeah that's so. a very good point. I think I see a very good point developing, and that is because when you auto format the code, it will look like you modified all the lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you then try to use git annotate to find out who was the, which commit was the last one modifying that line, you will see the auto formatting. Of course, yeah. then you can still go past that and search more into the history, but it, it can make history inspection more difficult. Also, I recommend to not, if you make a change to the code, uh, do not auto format at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I would run the auto formatting in a separate commit. It makes the reviewing easier and then the real change. Right, yeah to not hide the, the change under the radar a bit. Yeah. Um, we are already running here over time. There is so much more to say because oh, we should talk about compiled languages, but maybe we do that next time. Yeah. Well, if we have time, I would show this. Today I learned this one thing. It will. Yeah, let's do it. I'm bringing up your desktop. Um... Yeah, I will just, because we, we promised that we would show each other something new and I wanted to show something that I learned recently. And then we, let's take more questions, conclude. Am I sharing screen? I am. Yes. So something I have, I have recently learned, and it's a little bit meta because I have recently learned that I should write down things that I have recently learned. So what I started to do, and I encourage everybody to do it, I started this repository called Today I Learned, where I'm writing things that I learned. These are small things about Conda, documentation, GitHub, and so on. So every day I learn something new, I write it down. It's not enough for a blog post. And here you can see things that I did not know a couple of weeks ago. Of course, this is not my idea. I got it from this person, and it's and, and this person got the, got the idea from somebody else. But just by browsing this other person's today I learned, I learned like 10 new things. So I encourage you to write it down. I have already revisited things that I have written two weeks ago because I already forgot. And others others can browse and learn. So nice. maybe a tip for others. It would be neat it would be neat to have some sort of stream that takes this and like aggregates these so you can get them at a slow, constant rate oh, from like a everyone. daily digest of uh, things that other people have learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be read in no more than say 10 seconds or 30 seconds or something, mm. and then yeah. get it. Mm. So already running over time here. Let's maybe yeah. conclude. And we will do the, the rest of the questions and answers uh, in the epilogue. And yeah. so what, yeah. what we wanted to say is we really appreciate contributions, ideas, suggestions. Uh, still, since I'm still sharing screen, I can show you where you can file them. Mm -hmm. And also, while you're looking that up, can you all tell us, is this too simple, too advanced? Would you like some more, like, more advanced stuff, less advanced, whatever? How would you like this to be changed for next time? Yeah, yeah maybe we need to add more questions, more time for questions. Here, uh, there is this resource software, our notes, which is uh, a link from the website. And here we have issues, GitHub issues, where we track ideas. You can suggest 
new ideas, you can comment on them. So these are things that we would like to talk about eventually. And we already got your suggestions from, from viewers. So please keep them coming. Yeah. Much more to say, but maybe maybe next time. Yeah, so we can thank everyone for tuning in and well i guess at least i can hang around some to see if there's any more final questions here and yeah, i will also stick yeah. around we will answer the questions uh, thanks so much for for being here tell your friends and colleagues and hopefully see you next week mm -hmm. yeah okay have a good time yeah you know this is like when you say goodbye to someone and then walk the same direction where he's saying goodbye, <laughs> but hanging out here and seeing what else there is. Yes. Uh, All let's right. see. So now that we are inofficial, let's have a look at the questions. There is a question. Do you document your hints, the textual visually formatting hints to others? Hmm. Is this like, do I document what I do for it? Um, no. Do you document your hints? So actually, once when someone took a giant code base and ran a giant auto formatter on it, which then made it much harder for me to read, then I got, um, well, I went down and wrote down all the reasons why I don't like using an auto formatter. Um, let me see if I can find it somewhere. But what I think this question was about this. Was it about the today I learned? Mm. Yeah, so I documented mostly, maybe it will be interesting for somebody else, but uh, also that I can find it again because I will forget it again. And eventually maybe I will grow these into blog posts. So I will start really writing this down. Um, yeah, there's not much feedback about too easy, fast, about right, too slow, advanced. We had a bit less questions, but maybe because I had a different window arrangement and didn't manage to actually read the chat also at the same time. Yeah. This Vim keyboard binding seems interesting. Um, yeah, and this is a good point. Like for private things, you don't care so much, but when it's public, you do care more. That's a good way to think about it. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, if you know there's going to be a bunch of people there all with different styles and your personal preferences aren't going to matter in the long run anyway, then may as well start from the beginning with auto formatting just to keep it consistent. A little bit further up is a question. Some, some bigger teams have templates for pull requests mm. so that you have to ex explain what you did, what should be reviewed. Uh, like Richard just said, so you can have uh, you can add a template both for GitHub GitLab. So every time it can be issue template or pull request template, so that every time somebody opens an issue is already it's prefilled. Uh, what is the motivation? How to reproduce it? Uh, do you agree to the license terms? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, but please, uh, for those who are still here, yeah, please give us feedback. Something yeah. you, you liked, what we should improve. Yeah. But most importantly, idea for next time. So we don't have to decide this ourselves. So one thing I didn't say was that like when you review code, it can be also interesting to look at the thing that code that is going in, is the license compatible with my current license? Mm -hmm. I'm now busy in one project to remove commits which have been added in the past because they are problematic with the license. It's quite a big job. Also another thing that I thought like when you work on something super sensitive, 
I don't think it's the case for many of us, but something really, really sensitive. You should also look at who who is submitting this. Is this really the person? Mm -hmm. So is it is it it is signed? Like if you work on cri crypto uh, code, a Linux kernel, you have to be even careful, uh, really careful about what code is going in and review mm -hmm. everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, and about poetry, there you are here good things. I haven't started with it yet. I have used uh, Pipen for a while. Yeah. Do you like Pipen overall? Does it integrate with setup.py for releasing packages too? Or do you have to track that separately or have it parse the other thing? So I'm tracking it separately. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's a better way. Um, it It is one command less than virtual env, and I end up for most of my own work use actually virtual env. Mm -hmm. Some of the collaborative projects we use pipenv. Mm -hmm. And with pipenv, does it have this pip file and then pip file dot lock and right. pip file dot lock yeah. pins exact versions and yes. pip file is the generic ones. Yes, so that is one advantage compared to requirements of text is that if you are really careful about security and careful about the integrity of the dependencies mm. in requirements of text does not track the checksums, but the pipenv does with the log file. I see. So that can be one advantage. Yeah. Oh, you know, or more, uh, you had said yeah something about a shell alias that would set up a virtual end from a requirement.txt file. Yes. Do you want to show that quickly? Because I'm I can, interested. I can show it to you, yeah, here on screen share. Yeah. Um, let me see. I'm bringing up your desktop. Yeah, there it is. Uh, we'll just increase the font size. Mm -hmm. And I will move it up a bit. So what I have, uh, this is now not bash, it's fish shell, but mm -hmm. so there is functions. I have this alias called VE, virtual environment. Mm -hmm. And it, in fish it's called functions. Okay. But what it does, it I I do what you did. Mm -hmm. Actually, not exactly. I should really do Python minus n. Yeah. The end would be even better. I create the environment. I source it. I mm -hmm. check whether this file exists. If it exists, mm -hmm. I install it. Yeah. Often when I start with a new project, I write the requirements of text. I run this alias, and then it sets up it for me. Mm -hmm. And, and I then can... I have another one which is called VE2, which does it for Python 2 if I need to work on some older projects. Uh, yeah. And if the environment already exists, does it, will it try to recreate it or? Uh, I, I had the idea this afternoon that I should improve the function and yeah. uh, and it should then not recreate it if it already exists. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's not, not that clever. Yeah. So if I see that it's there, I source it directly. Mm -hmm. Oh, we get now more questions going, and that is this the feedback and all about complexity is about right. Uh, next session, Git hooks. Great suggestion. We could talk about client side hooks and server side hooks because I use these server side hooks a lot. Mm -hmm. um, then why not just install all the main libraries as system libs? And then use Python for user, uh, also Python path. And then what? There is one answer. I think virtual environments encourage to code to specific versions much more than general versions. Yeah. So one reason to do that would be, it could be difficult to decide what are the main libraries, and and then uh, if I have different projects, they can depend on different versions of the main libraries, and they could mm -hmm. even be conflicting. Yeah. And that's why I would prefer to have it set. In, to put these into isolated environments. Yeah. I try to avoid 
pip install dash dash user except for very generic things. So on our cluster, it's sort of a common thing. Someone will install something with pip install dash dash user and then start some other virtual environment or actually a conda environment and then say this conda environment isn't working. Why? Because their pip install dash dash user stuff conflicts with that. So it's actually loading the version they installed several years ago instead of what we tried to install in this environment. And it becomes sort of a huge mess. So what I always tell people is if you do pip install dash dash user, it'll work for a while, but expect that eventually you'll have to delete everything there and start creating it again from scratch in order to keep it clean which I think sort of goes to the one of the main points of the virtual environments. Because you can always delete it all and then recreate it, you know that you always have your stuff very carefully under control. And you always no, know what your code no, you is have, using. You it. Sorry. sorry. Uh, go ahead. No, you, you have it also documented. Mm. Because if I, if mm -hmm. I see the required text, it's, it's really in my face. Yeah. I can see it there, and it documents what I'm depending on. Yeah. rather than it being somehow on the system somewhere. Yeah. And I do install some libraries through Debian packages operating system-wide, but then I never use sudo pip to install stuff system-wide, because then in the system-wide paths, there's some stuff that's installed through Debian and some through pip, and then when Debian upgrades, the pip stuff won't be upgraded and you could get incompatible versions or they start overriding each other. So basically one location and one way I install stuff there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anything we missed? Uh, there's a XKCD comic here that's probably going to be good. I'm opening it up here just for me HackMD? Uh, on Twitch chat. I'll copy oh. it to HackMD. Oh, there I see. oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly it. <laughs> mm -hmm. When I started, I started with like easy install. Then I went into pip install system wide and regularly installing the operating system. <laughs> then, uh, then I did the pip install user, but regularly nuking the directory. And these days, I I think the only thing I install system wide is virtual env, which is not, not, not even needed anymore with Python 3. Mm -hmm. And else, maybe there was some, one, one thing more that I'm pip env. Yeah. Yeah. At one point, I went through a phase of manually installing with python setup.py install and then setting python path just so I could have full control of things and know, like make sure nothing was installed that I wasn't aware of and couldn't clean up later. But now I think virtual envs is, well, yeah. good enough. I think it's yeah, good enough. Yeah. We talk about all this, uh, I think we should do it next time. Uh, like how to do that now for a C code, C++ code. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. R. I think that's definitely, we can spend 10, 15 minutes next time on that. Yeah. And, and containers, operating system, we didn't talk about that. Yeah. So for the next session, do you want to talk about, I like, see there's two questions here, one for bare repos and one for Git hooks. Maybe we can take one of these as the longer advanced topic for next time mm -hmm. and record the other one for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think so Git hooks. Yeah, Actually, this sounds really good. Git hooks and we can combine it with maybe documentation. Yeah. Something that the GitHub does. Mm -hmm. or, or automated testing. Yeah. About the Git repos, I don't know whether we should answer it now. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, maybe it's... bare repos, it won't take very long and is, well, I think we wouldn't go into much more depth than we can do in a few minutes anyway. Do you want to talk about it or should I? 
So I can I can start and you can complete me. So it's a a, a bare repo is is a repository only for archiving, but I mean only for synchronizing, but not really not really to go in there and and edit files and work. So a bare repo a bare repository is is typically what you have on GitHub. So on GitHub GitLab, they are saving a bare repository, but I'm I'm typically then working on on a non bare one where I have the recorded commits, but where I also have a working tree. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, please complete me. What, what did yeah. I miss? I think that's basically it. So the reason you would have a bare repo instead of a full checkout is that it's, like Radovan said, just for synchronizing. And you don't want anyone to go on the server and edit files without committing it. So it's just for transferring the Git history and not for editing stuff. When do you need it? You need it, to, at least I needed it only if I want to set up my own Git server, which I want to have on my own machine, not on GitHub, not on GitLab, not on Bitbucket. Mm -hmm. Then I need to know about the repositories. And also it can show up. You can do a Git clone dash dash mirror, which is really mirroring uh, the repository, and I think it's even a little bit more than it's not a Git clone because a Git clone copies it and sets up local branches. But sometimes you want to take a copy as it is, mm. and then what you have locally is a bare repository. I see. So the bare repository doesn't have anything checked out, so there's no concept of local branches there, I guess. This can be useful if you want to mm. mirror a repository from one place to another place. And you want to do it through your computer and not through the importer that somebody else programmed. And I think it's fun to try Git clone mirror, then you can go in and have a look and you can see how a bare repository look, looks like. Does Git clone dash dash mirror automatically make it a bare repository? I think so, yes. Okay. And then you can go in and you can do Git push dash dash mirror into some other place. And this is how you can move it, the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And somebody commented here, maybe you reached it, I don't know, but the yeah, it is really like the .git data folder mm -hmm. that you see in a regular repository. So everything below, so yeah. nothing else. Yeah. And all local branches checked out. Yeah. Yeah, dependencies of C++ will be very interesting. We plan to talk about it, but we are out of time, but we will come back to that. And also uh, talk about how to handle dependencies in CMake. Mm -hmm. So sorry that we didn't manage. It's yeah. super important, but it's out for next time. Yeah. So Radovan, I hear or get the idea you're the CMake expert around here. I don't know what I yeah, I've, <laughs> I've I've done written my fair share and of CMake my fair share of CMake mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's CMake more than nice. me. Yeah. Should we uh, close the recording and uh, the call? Yeah, the night? I guess and... so. It seems like we're there's there's just one last question. Git shallow clone could also be interesting to discuss. Which honestly, I should do some research before I answer that. I yeah, think I know can... what it means, but I'm not entirely sure. So uh, I think you can. So with a clone, you get everything, all the history, all the branches. Mm -hmm. If it's a gigantic repository and you are maybe not interested in the history, you can do a shallow clone where you get only, only the, uh, only like the latest commits or only mm -hmm. a particular branch. Okay. But it's still the entire all files that are in the current version. You'll yes. Get. Okay. You cannot, uh, I don't think. No, you cannot do partial. Uh, clones where you only get the directory like, mm -hmm. because simply the way you get it set up. Mm -hmm. Something you could do you know you can do in yeah you can do it in SVN. Yeah. Okay. Well with that being said I guess we'll stop for the night. Thanks to everyone who came. Thanks for all the ideas for next time. We'll take some of these and develop the next program. Um if you have any particular interest, remember to post to the RSH notes repository. 
And I guess you can also upvote there, or what's it called, like GitHub thumbs up, or, well, whatever it is, react there to what you're most interested in seeing. And we can assemble it based on that. Also, thanks to whoever was helping to keep the hackpad organized and transfer stuff from chat. That was that saved us a lot of mental effort here. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. And thanks to Chris and thanks, Richard. Yeah. Okay. So see y'all next week. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good night.